details of this project called the Gluck of the Bell. He describes a device that's bell-shaped. It's about 12 to 15 feet high, if I remember. It's about um, 12, you know, maybe 12 feet wide. It's bell-shaped. It's either, it's described in terms that, that make you think it's either a, a ceramic cover or a ceramic metal. It's cryogenically cooled, either with liquid helium or liquid uh, oxygen, something that's going to, to super cool it. And on the inside of this device, there are two rotating cylinders. Borenberg describes that they poured into these counter-rotating cylinders a substance called Serum 525, which was described in the affidavit, supposedly, as a very heavy, dense, viscous, gooey metal that was a deep maroon or cherry red color. There were enough details that you could sit down and kind of reverse engineer the thinking, the physics thinking that the Germans may have been uh, employing in this device. We also have heard from a variety of insiders and from the papers and the data that came out that the Germans also had developed an interesting system based on the so-called red mercury in which the rotation of mercury in a highly charged electrostatic tube leads to an anti-gravitational field as well. So this serum 525 is put into these counter-rotating cylinders and they're spun up, you know, to high speed in opposite directions. And what this is going to do, just to explain a bit of the physics for a moment, it's going to cohere the rotation of the atoms and molecules of this substance on one plane. Okay, so there, in other words, it's going to align the axis of rotation of these things. Spornberg also describes that it makes a buzzing sound or a hissing sound. So the Germans actually nicknamed, apparently, this nicknamed this device De, uh, Der Wiedenstock, the beehive, because it's buzzing, it's making this buzz. When I was studying Del Shell's artwork, um, I saw something that was stunning. Um, this had to do with the propulsion system, the energy system for one of these arrows from the 1850s. And what it was, was something that uh, Delshaw identifies as a generator cone. Okay, and it rotates, spins on a central axis that it's fixed to. And this mystery fuel, liquid fuel, is injected into the process. Well, the shape of this thing is the shape of a common shape of a bell. My jaw dropped because you're talking about Germans. You're talking about a spinning bell-shaped object with a secretive liquid fuel serum. Here was um, this same exact basic concept um, in the 1850s that Delshaw clearly in the 1890s included in one of his drawings. We have indications that the Germans are experimenting with some substance that is being zapped with lots of electricity. And right there, that tells me plasma. The substance is heavy, it's liquid, and it's red. So that tells me it's probably metallic. It's probably an oxide of mercury and you know something else in chemical compound. So what they're creating, in effect, is a version of the sun. Because the sun's a plasma, it's under electromagnetic stress, you've got the differential rotation of the plasma, and that's going to create what physicists call torsion. I think that the Bell device is a device designed by mimicking the sun to create a maximum torsion shear effect. And as a result, it's going to create a kind of magnetic bubble or cancellation of the gravitational field. And in fact, this is what is reported of the bell because the concentration camp victims who apparently saw this being tested at night on the surface saw something that looked like a barrel glowing a pale blue, rising, you know, kind of levitating and then falling back down below the tree line. The Houndabu is your classic UFO. Looks like a UFO that you've seen in a thousand magazines. So they developed the Hanabu around the bell, and they had to shield the Hanabu because the bell gives off so much radiation and heat and a lot of other things. 
at the end of the war, the Nazis executed the scientists and technicians, the middle echelon scientists and technicians involved with the project to keep it from falling into the hands of the Russians and the Allies. I think aspects of this project ended up in Argentina and were experimented upon under independent Nazi control even after the war, which is very logical because if you've got that kind of technology, the atom bomb is kind of a, you know, it's kind of a Model T technology. You can give that to the Americans, you know. But this we're going to keep for ourselves, and we're going to we're going to work on this some more. And I think that's exactly what they did. All of this adds up to me that they are experimenting with a prototypical kind of proof of concept torsion technology, field propulsion technology. So these technologies were combined together to develop an actual working flying saucer significantly in advance of when we normally would think of anyone in our Earth governments coming into contact with this, i.e. the Roswell crash. The Germans had about a 10-year head start on that. Before his death in 1995, Ben Rich, the father of the stealth bomb bomber and head of Lockheed Martin's top-secret Skunk Works research facilities, said this to a group of people after a speech. We already have the means to travel amongst the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do.